Well, hey, good morning, everyone. It's Chris Wilson with Torah and Messiah YouTube channel. Uh, coming to you with another chapter of Principle of the Seed. Today we're in chapter 7. The Comforter Cannot Come Until I Go. And this is by Brad Scott. So uh, let us thank Yahweh for the wonderful week that he has given us this past week and the wonderful Sabbath that he has blessed us with. And may he protect and guide us this upcoming week and for today. And uh, may he bless you all who are listening here today as well. Thank you for being here. If this is your first time, uh, please go back through and check out some of the other content. And let me know if you like it by sharing or leaving your comments. And uh, please subscribe if you haven't already. Now thank you and uh, let us begin. Many moons ago while doing the research for the seed, I came across some very interesting comments in the World Book Encyclopedia under its section on seeds. The words I read burned even more in my heart the truth that there was such a revealing connection between the natural and the spiritual. The more I looked outside my window to behold the beautiful creation of our Father, the more I see his word expressed in that creation. What is even more thought-provoking about this virtual symbiotic truth is that the more I consume the spiritual truth of his word, the more I see his creation embedded in his word. As I read the, this description of the nature of seeds in the encyclopedia, I could not help but think of what John chapter 16 verse 7. Why my thoughts leap to this verse is not to a reason. I believe it is simply the way Yahweh designed his word to work in our lives. Yochanan, or John chapter 16, verse 7, quote, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you, end quote. Now, I have heard and read many commentaries on this verse, many of which simply dance around these words. Some say that he had to leave in order to return with a glorified body, so that we too might also have a glorified body. Most commentaries put all the emphasis on Messiah leaving, but very little attention to the direct connection that Yeshua makes to the Comforter being sent. Now, I have much to say later on in this chapter concerning this comment and other similar remarks by Yeshua. In this verse, I believe the emphasis is on the Comforter coming to us. Playing the part of the smart Alec kid in the front row, I would raise my hand and ask why the Holy Spirit would not come unless Yeshua departed. I believe this question is at least partially answered by looking outside our window and is written about in the World Book Encyclopedia under Seeds. Quote, Seeds are the most important part of the plant. The roots, the leaves, the flowers, the fruit, all exist so there can be seed. If the seeds fell straight to the ground beneath the plant that bore them, they would be too crowded to thrive. The seeds must be scattered or dispersed. Most seeds are scattered by the wind. End quote. Now let me remind you that according to the use of this word in the scriptures, the seed is the word of Elohim, and became flesh and dwelt among us. Will we not all agree that the seed is the most important part of the plant? In the natural, we also see that what the seed produces exists so there can be more seed. We are the fruit of the Messiah, or the word of Elohim, in the kingdom of Elohim. In the natural, we are the fruit of our parents. In the spiritual, we are the fruit of the word of Yah. Within us is another seed. When we express the fruit of the word of Yahweh in us, a friend, a stranger, a brother or sister, a mother, a father, or a wife, sees that fruit and either receives it, which is him, or rejects it, which is him. If they receive our fruit, then in that fruit is another seed, just like the one that produced our fruit. My friends, you and I exist to produce the fruit of the seed that is in us, for I can assure you that the same principle works for the other seed as well. The adversary, Hasatan, at enmity with the good seed, is out multiplying after himself as we speak. Yahweh's little remnant has a responsibility to produce fruit so that there can be seed. Now the definition goes on to say that if these seeds, you and I, fell straight to the ground beneath the plant that bore them, they would be too crowded to thrive. Let us take a short trip back to the first chapter of Masai Hashilakim, that is the book of Acts. Remember when the disciples asked Yeshua if the kingdom was now being restored to Israel? Remember his response? 
Acts chapter 1, verse 7 and 8, quote, And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth, end quote. Before the kingdom is restored to Israel, these disciples, fruit bearing his seed, must go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. Even a cursory read of the book of Acts reveals that our Creator practically had to boot them out of Jerusalem. They did what was natural. They clung to their own, and they continued to embrace familiarity. Could you imagine how difficult it would have been to send them out to the dispersed house of Israel had Yeshua remained with them? Or could I say, if they continued to cling to the plant that bore them? According to the writings of the prophets, the kingdom cannot come to Israel until all of Israel is in the kingdom. Apostle Paul concurred in Romans chapter 11, verse 25, quote, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. End quote. According to the prophets, the house of Israel and the house of Judah are scattered throughout the world. The disciples are commissioned to go get them. How will these scattered people be found? Through our fruit. By what we say and what we do as we go to the uttermost parts of the earth. So in the natural picture of a tree, the seeds must be scattered in order to multiply the good, the good seed, and the seeds are scattered by the wind. The English words Holy Spirit are, of course, taken from their Hebrew meanings. The word spirit is the Hebrew word ruach, which in its verbal action root is the wind. The reason this word is used to describe the active, demonstrative presence of Yahweh is because the wind is his way in the natural of picturing a spiritual reality. The physical representation of Yahweh, Yeshua, had to be removed in order for the Comforter to scatter the disciples. The plant can only be in one place at one time, but the wind is ubiquitous. It or he is omnipresent. I believe the encyclopedia quote is a great picture of Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Further, I find it interesting to see that the Holy Spirit is sent to reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Yeshua goes on to say in John 16, 13, that this same Spirit is to come to guide us into all truth. This is consistent with Yeshua's statement in John 14, 26 concerning the Holy Spirit as well. John 14, 26, quote, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you, end quote. Here are the consistent facts, whether we as children like them or not. Yahweh reveals the end from the beginning. In the beginning, for those who have an ear to hear, we are given beautiful prophetic pictures and patterns, which are laws, that are consistent throughout the rest of Scripture, particularly in the end. One of the first laws or patterns that are established in the beginning is the pattern of the perfection, fall, and restoration. Our Father initially reveals this pattern in the physical creation. Why? Because the physical creation comes first, so he places truth in this creation right from the start. Genesis 1.1 is an absolute statement of a completed act. In the beginning, Elohim created the heaven and the earth. Soon afterward, how soon I have not a clue, our future adversary challenges the creator, falls from his created nature, and causes the earth to be without form and void, that is, chaos and formlessness. I cover these passages in much more detail in our teaching series called Bereshit, the Book of Beginnings. I am not a believer in the so-called gap theory, but I do take a very detailed look at the actual occurrence of Yeshaya 14, 12 through 20. The similarities here and the testimony of other scriptural verses cannot be ignored. In verse 2 we have Elohim restoring the creation for the habitation of humans, those of whom he will love, John 3:16. This recorded Recorded event is a perfect picture of the same process that the first man will experience. Adam, mankind, will be created perfect and complete. He will fall, and Elohim will restore him. This order will be repeated in all the whosoevers that will receive it. This initial, initial picture, beginning with the earth, creation, and following with mankind, also gives us insight into the very clear connection between man and the land or the ground. The ground or land is Adama in Hebrew. The word for man is Adam. The Adam is taken from the Adama. When Adam physically dies, he goes back to the Adama. 
Genesis 3.19. The same pattern that is revealed in the Adama is also revealed in the one who was taken from the ground. After that, we see that the land has a Sabbath and the man has a Sabbath. The land has a tithe and the man has a tithe. The land receives the seed and the man receives the seed. The land is to produce fruit and the man is to produce fruit. Ad nasium infimentum. All right, my friends, and that is chapter 7. I'm going to go ahead and pause it there, and we'll come back and read chapter 8 tomorrow. Who is Israel? That last little phrase that I read closing out chapter 7 was a Latin phrase. We can define that, see what that means in an upcoming teaching. And uh, what's unique is we just read the Torah portion this weekend, if you were with me on my live hangout on uh, the Shabbat. Uh, and it talked about the land Sabbath. <clears throat> and I encourage you to go back and read that in Leviticus chapter 25 and 26. And um, yeah, what a what a compelling statement of truth there that Brad brings out um, about the land Sabbath and the Sabbath for man and um, what we read in the Torah portion this weekend concerning today's reading. Well, thank you, folks. I do appreciate you tuning in with me. And I want, I want to ask uh, Yahweh to bless your day and bless everything that is in your life today. May he bring you joy and peace and shalom. And may he also meet the needs of those who listen to this podcast. And uh, may he be with you and guide you um, in your endeavors of studying the word. Uh, thanks again, everyone. And may Yahweh bless you. Shalom. Israel, put your hope in Yahweh.